Iowa Public Television. IPTV. Acquisition of this program was made possible by Friends of Iowa Public Television. And funding for the Iowa broadcast is provided by Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, since 1861, an environment for academic excellence. And by CRST, a family-owned company based in Iowa and a major truck carrier in the United States, which is proud to support the McNeil Lara News Hour. Good evening. I'm Jim Lair in New York. I'm Roger Mudd in Washington. After our summary of the day's news, we look at the pros and cons of today's decision to airlift aid to the former Soviet republics. The State Department's number two man plus four experts join us. Then Tom Bearden reports on a city that refused to come to the aid of its school system. And finally, a Clarence Page essay on conspiracy theories. Part of helping the world live and communicate better is keeping it well informed. That's why funding for the McNeil Lair News Hour is provided by AT&T. And by PepsiCo. PepsiCo. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And viewers like you. The U.S. Air Force will begin flying emergency food and medical supplies to the former Soviet republics next month. Secretary of State Baker announced the operation at the conclusion of a Washington conference on aiding the new republics. He said the first of 54 flights will be February 10th. He said shipments will go to all 12 states. Of course, no airlift could ever come close to meeting all the needs of the people of the new independent states. But this airlift that we are calling Operation Provide Hope can help deliver the food and medical supplies that are critically needed. Above all, Operation Provide Hope can vividly show the peoples of the former Soviet Union that those that once prepared for war with them now have the courage and the conviction to use their militaries to say, we will wage a new peace. A spokesman for Russian President Boris Yeltsin said today, said today's announcement contained nothing surprising. He said Russia had similar agreements already with Italy and Germany. Yeltsin himself said in a message delivered to the conference he had suspended all import restrictions in his republic. He declared it open to foreign investment. The defense minister of Ukraine today said his republic might sell arms to foreign nations unless it gets more aid from the West. Michael Nicholson of Independent Television News reports. They're going to melt down the glory to communism statue overlooking Kiev. With titanium the price it is, this could be the one Soviet investment that's paid dividends here. But there are others. At a military display come museum, there are artillery, aircraft and tanks still currently being used by the various Republican armies. They include the SS-20 missile, the T-64 tank, the Shilka anti-air defense system, the hind attack helicopter, the MiG-23. It could easily pass as Kiev's permanent trade fair, a military showground, because these could soon be on offer to weapon-hungry nations and arms dealers if the bankrupt Ukrainian government is forced to sell its vast stocks. Some buyers might be interested in more than tanks and planes and guns. Deep inside its secret forest site at Velaya Serkov, 40 miles south of Kiev, a nuclear warhead is carefully removed from its missile and launch pad. It's not large, but it's equal to the bomb that demolished Hiroshima. The Ukraine is pledged to destroy 136 of its 176 missiles under the Start Disarmament program. But no one is certain what happens to the remaining 40 or what their price is on the open market. But all such anxiety about arms sales could end, says Defense Minister Viktor Antonov, if only the West would help out with cash. And that it refuses to do. Our economy, like the other republics, is in the state of crisis. And yes, we'll sell arms if we have to. And I confirm we have potential customers already. But no, Saddam Hussein is not among them, or any regime like his. Ukraine is one of four republics to have an arsenal of former Soviet nuclear weapons. 
The governor of the Baltic Republic of Estonia resigned today. It had failed to win parliamentary support for its efforts to solve Estonia's economic crisis. Estonia won independence from the Soviet Union last September, but has since suffered food and energy shortages. We'll have more on the aid issue right after this news summary. Roger. The U.S. is reportedly considering deep new cuts in its nuclear arsenal. The New York Times today quoted administration officials who said the cuts could sharply reduce or eliminate long-range missiles with multiple warheads, which are the core of the U.S. nuclear force. Many of the cuts could be made unilaterally. The president is expected to propose the cuts in his State of the Union address next week. A deputy defense minister of Russia said today his republic must cut its army in half. He said it can no longer afford to support the force of almost four million. He predicted it could be cut by two million soldiers in the next two years. The U.S. Labor Department today reported an increase in the number of Americans filing new claims for unemployment benefits. They said 447,000 people filed during the week ending January 11th, 46,000 more than the week before. A House committee began hearings today on a $4.5 billion bill to extend jobless benefits. Last year, similar legislation was vetoed by President Bush for budget reasons. He later agreed to a compromise version. At today's hearing, Democratic Congressman Tom Downey of New York called on the president to support the new plan. Can anyone doubt the need for further extension of unemployment benefits? The president has acknowledged that many American workers are hurting. I wish he could be here today to hear from those who have come to t tell their stories. They too want jobs, 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 but until those jobs are forthcoming, they want an extension of benefits so that they and their families can survive. A report in today's Washington Post said Mr. Bush plans to endorse some kind of extension. At a White House photo session, reporters asked him today if that support represented an election year conversion. What we did uh, before is to guarantee that the extensions were within the federal budget because, you see, I think the American people are also concerned about the federal government spending too much. And what I did was stand for a program that would alleviate the suffering and would get the checks to individuals, but did it inside the budget agreement. So it wasn't a conversion. It was fighting for what was right, the taxpayer, as well as those that were hurting, and we prevailed. We prevailed in both instances, but you stay tuned for the next chapter. It'll be coming out. Mr. Bush has said he will reveal his economic plans in his State of the Union address. Los Angeles officials have canceled a $122 million contract with the Japanese company to build rail cars for a new mass transit system. Public protests arose when the city's Transportation Commission awarded the contract to the Sumitomo Corporation in spite of a lower bid by an American firm. Local citizens complain that city tax dollars should be used to create American jobs, not Japanese ones. Vice President Dan Quayle said today Americans should avoid bashing Japan. He said the relationship between the two countries is getting better, not worse. He made his remarks in a speech at Arizona State University. How many of the protectionists that we have have ever mentioned that Japan is the single largest market for American agricultural exports? and our second largest market overall. Obviously, the trends are moving clearly and strongly in the right direction. And to, to suggest otherwise is simply mindless Japan bashing. That does not mean that Japan shouldn't open its market further. It will, and we will help them do it. Japan's parliament announced today it too will try to persuade skeptical Japanese to buy American cars. As part of President Bush's so-called action plan to reduce Japan's trade surplus with the U.S., the Parliament said it would buy two General Motors Buicks, Park Avenue model, for its official use. A major pharmaceutical company said today it will provide free heart drugs to Americans without health insurance. Bristol-Myers Squibb will make 17 drugs available beginning March 1st. The Australian Olympic basketball team is considering boycotting the games if Magic Johnson competes. The Australian team physician suggested the boycott because of Johnson's HIV infection. He said today other players risk contracting AIDS from Johnson through bleeding from an injury. A military appeals panel in Israel today overturned an order to deport a Palestinian. He was one of 12 ordered out of the occupied territories for anti-Israeli activities. It's believed to be only the second time in 25 years a deportation order has been reversed. 
the deportation of the 11 others was upheld. That's it for the news summary. Just ahead on the news hour, a winter airlift to the old Soviet republics, a school with a math problem, and another conspiracy theory. Coming to the aid of what used to be the Soviet Union is our lead story tonight. An international conference on what and how much to do ended today in Washington with the announcement U.S. planes will fly international food and medicine shipments to the newly independent republics beginning in February. The total U.S. aid pledge is about $5 billion, mostly in credits, to buy American agricultural products among, uh, agricultural products. among other nations. The largest donor thus far is Germany which has pledged or delivered $35 billion. Japan has pledged, but not yet dispensed, $2.5 billion in assistance. Its foreign minister said today that until territorial disputes were resolved with the former Soviet republics, no more large-scale aid would be given. We begin our discussion about the aid conference with the number two man in the U.S. State Department, Deputy Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger. Mr. Secretary, welcome. Thank you. Do you and uh, Secretary Baker consider this conference a success? Well, I think quite substantially so. It's done a number of things, but most importantly, I think, what it's done is involve a number of countries in this whole question of assistance to the Soviet Union. It's a global, it's a global matter now, and before this conference, it was largely the U.S., the, the uh, West Europeans, and people like that who were doing things for the Soviet Union. Now we've got Japan, Mexico, you name them. We, almost everybody was there. And they've all agreed, more or less, to do things to try to assist the Soviet Union, or the on, former Soviet Union. On the more or less point, how much new real aid was actually pledged? Oh, I don't have a, a figure compiled in my head, but it ranges from Mexico agreeing to do some things with cities in the former Soviet Union to $50 million pledged by the Japanese to the $640 million that the President has asked for from the Congress. It's well into the billions, but I couldn't tell you how much specifically. Why, why, why not, Mr. Secretary? I'm curious as to why somebody didn't sit down and figure out what it's all involved here. Well, they may have sat down and figured it out. I haven't figured out out is all I'm saying. Beyond which, a number of things that have been done, I can't put a dollar figure on at this point. Uh, there are a number, of, as I say, for instance, the Mexicans have said mm -hmm. they're going to do some things in various cities throughout the former Soviet Union. I can't put a figure on that at this point. A number of other countries have said they would uh, be providing assistance, but no dollar figures on all of it. So I don't have a total figure for you. How was the number, I'm just curious, how was the number of 54 U.S. flights arrived at? Was that based on a specific need and all of that? It's based basically on the amount of food available that we have available to ship, uh, plus the fact that we were trying to figure out exactly how many cities to put it all into. So it's, it's, it's essentially based on the, the quantity of food available that we're going to ship. How were the, the, uh, the needs of these uh, republics, these 12 republics, arrived at? Were, uh, was a canvas of that, of, on the ground over there? Or did you uh, get proposals from them? or, or what, how, how did that work? Well, there's been a canvas in some of the republics, obviously not in all because we haven't had enough people or been able to do it. But there have been estimates of the kinds of food necessary and how much has been necessary. We have had contacts with each of the republics. And based on what we've been able either to establish ourselves or to get in the way of information from those republics, we decided essentially where the food would go and how much would go there. Do you have a feeling the people, who, the people in the countries and the organizations, 47 and all, that were at this conference, do you all have a feeling that you really do have a, a feel for what the needs are in very concrete terms? We have a feel, and I'm glad you used the word, we mm -hmm. have a feel for the needs. One of the things I think that has come out of this conference is that by exchanging information amongst the more than 50 mm -hmm. countries and organizations. We have a better collective sense based on what each of us have been, has been able to provide in the way of information. We have a better sense of what is needed, beyond which there has been agreement at this conference that we will collectively be examining in much more detail exactly what is needed and sharing that information. The German foreign minister said today he, was, he continued to be disappointed, as he was before the conference began, that the United States would not allow representatives of the 12 former Soviet republics to attend and participate in this conference. Why not? Well, they'll be at the next conference, obviously, but at this stage, the reason we decided to do it differently because is at this stage we wanted to talk amongst the various donors and potential donors about the kinds of activities and things that might be granted without having to get into some sort of a competition or, or you know, some sort of monopoly game, if I may say so, at a conference 
in which the, the potential recipients were being played off against the potential donors. What we did this time was get a far better sense of what the donors are prepared to do. So it was more of a, of a means conference than it was a needs conference? Well, it was a, it, obviously we had to judge the means against what we thought the needs were, and we're obviously going to have to do more to establish exactly what needs are there of an emergency nature. I emphasize this conference was on emergency assistance. But the fact of the matter is we were basically trying to discover what the donors, potential donors, knew about what was needed, how we would coordinate our activities in terms of providing that assistance, and to go beyond that, how we would then go further to see what, was, what we could do to establish the, the needs more clearly in the, what was the Soviet Union. What is your reaction to the statements? We had them in the news summary a moment ago. You saw them from the Ukraine's uh, uh, defense minister that if the West, <coughs> this conference, uh, the United States and other countries do not provide aid, and he's talking cash, then Ukraine may have to sell some of those tanks and weapons that we saw a moment ago. Well, I have several reactions to it. The first of which is it's a very bad idea. The second of which is it that would strike me at least a bit as sort of a, one method of trying to convince us we ought to provide aid. Uh, I don't think that's the way to establish the need, much less to persuade the West to provide the assistance. We will do that based on what we think is necessary, not on somebody's threat that they'll sell something if we don't provide money. You don't think that's a legitimate, in other words, you don't think that would influ should influence the decision on, uh, on aiding Ukraine specifically? No, I don't think it should influence our decisions on what we provide. I will concede that if I were the defense minister of the U Ukraine, I might well make the same statement, but that doesn't mean that it's something we ought to pay too much attention to. Our, for us, the issue is what's necessary, mm -hmm. not do we prevent somebody from selling arms by paying money to, to make it, to avoid it. But do you have any sympathy for the Ukraine's basic position that, all right, the United States and the West wants us to get rid of these weapons. We need money more than, we got an economic crisis on our hands, so what, why not sell our thing? I mean, are you saying they shouldn't sell it or they shouldn't say they're going to sell it? <laughs> I'm saying that the, there is no need to sell it. They should not sell it. The fact of the matter is there, we have agreements on the reduction of conventional arms. Clearly, we also would be very unhappy if they were to talk about selling nuclear weapons. The fact of the matter is, yes, I have sympathy for their economic problem. And yes, we ought to be doing something about it. The sale of arms, if we don't provide assistance, does not seem to me to be a very sensible way of persuading the West that it ought, in fact, to be assisting them economically. All right, the Japanese foreign minister said today that uh, Japan wasn't prepared to do any more right now until they resolve some territorial problems with these former Soviet republics. What's that all about? Well, I think that's a slight exaggeration of what he said, because as a matter of fact, the Japanese have indicated that they are prepared to provide $50 million for uh, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. The Japanese have also offered to host the third conference, the third uh, aid mm -hmm. conference, and I think that, by the way, is a fairly significant step on the part of the Japanese, but it is also clear that the Japanese have a specific problem with regard to the former Soviet Union, which is the Kurile Islands, and until that is resolved, as far as their position is concerned, there are going to be limits on what they're prepared to do. Is that a position supported by the United States? That's a position that's the J Japanese business. We don't support it. We obviously, on the other hand, understand why they've said it. How would you respond, Mr. Secretary, to Americans in Congress and elsewhere who say, uh, hey, this is, we understand that the 12 former Soviet republics got bad economic problems, but so does the United States of America. We're in a recession. Why should we help those people before we help our own? Well, I, you know, there's a great deal to be said for that position, and, and no one in this administration would argue for one moment that there isn't a great deal that needs to be done at home. But I think the basic argument here is that the United States, for the better part of the last 50 years, has expended some hundreds of billions of dollars to arrive at precisely the point we now are, namely that the former Soviet Union is no longer the strategic threat it was to the West. We have gotten to the point where that is now an accomplished fact. It would be tragic, after having invested all of that money, if we were not prepared to spend the money necessary to make sure that the process of democratization continues in the Soviet Union, that the, or the former Soviet Union, that the process of economic change and turning toward a market economy does not succeed. It would be a tragedy if we let that fail now. We can get into arguments about how much ought to be done, and I suspect before the evening is out we will. But the issue is not, at least in my mind, whether we should do something. And the American people, I think, understand that. 
I think, in fact, you, would, you could well argue that the investment that will be made and has been made in trying to assist the former Soviet Union to change, to become a democracy, to become a market economy, is as much in the interests of the well-being of the average American citizen as anything we can do. In what way? Well, in the sense that it helps to hopefully make sure that we do not face again the kind of threat that we faced for the better part of the post-war period from an antagonistic Soviet Union that was prepared, if, if they had the chance, to move against the West. You think the stakes are that high, and what was, that, what was on the table at this aid conference? Well, you know, obviously everybody at the aid conference understood all of this, and everybody, I think, there recognized that in talking about the emergency relief that's necessary, that a part of this was we do not want to see a collapse now of the reform process that is beginning to take place. And that should that happen, the obvious answer would be some form of, of authoritarian government in those various republics. And the, the, obviously thereafter, the threat to us would again be a part of the problem we would have to face. For the first time in the post-war era, the United States and the democratic West does not have to face the threat of thermonuclear war from an antagonistic dictatorship run out of Moscow. We ought, not, we ought to be prepared to provide some investment to assure that, that, that we don't return to those days. All right. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Roger? We'll get a sampling of reaction now to these current efforts to aid the former, uh, former Soviet Republic, reaction that is both economic and political. Here in the studio is Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, who's a professor of economics at Harvard University and also the economic advisor to Boris Yeltsin's Russian government. And Dr. Judy Shelton a senior research fellow at the Hoover Institution and the author of The Coming Soviet Crash. On Capitol Hill, Congressman Sam Gadenson, a Democrat from Connecticut and a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and Representative Henry Hyde, Republican from Illinois, also a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Let me ask uh, the four of you, beginning with Mr. Hyde, for your reaction to the announcement uh, by Secretary Baker of the, uh, of the airlift to the former Soviet uh, Union. Mr. Hyde? Is that well, the right step to take? Yes, I think it makes a lot of sense. I agree with what Larry Eagleburger said. Uh, we have a great stake in preserving the tentative steps towards democracy that the former Soviet Union is making. It would be a disaster if that failed uh, because we didn't come forward with some aid along with the rest of the world. Uh, this is a coalition of many countries, and our... A contribution is is modest uh, in comparison to theirs. Uh, it's it's substantial by itself, but I think uh, it's in our interests uh, to see that this experiment in democracy uh, works and doesn't fail over there. Mr. Gadenson? Well, for 50 years we were told that Americans had to shoulder the burden uh, for the defense of Western Europe because, after all, the Germans, having played the role they did in World War II, couldn't do it. Now we're being told that Americans have to borrow money from the Germans, because remember, we're borrowing this money to do it, uh, to finance uh, what's happening in the Soviet Union. And at the same time, the administration, and today I was just fighting with the Commerce Department, is holding up $50 million for economic development funds for defense-dependent communities. The president tells us, don't look for a budget that has a lot of programs to help put people back to work in the United States because we don't have the money, but we have $600 uh, million dollars to send to the Soviet Union. It seems to me that the political agenda in Washington has to be one where we first see an administration ready to help American workers, defense-dependent communities, people who are losing their homes, be put back to work. And then I think you'll find uh, the President and Mr. Eagleburger, the Secretary of State, find much more support in the Congress. I think what angers us is the fact that we've seen resistance to every po a program to revitalize the American economy. Last year, as the administration bottled up $200 million of diversification funds, it supported $500 million of diversification funds for the Soviet Union. Again, ready to help another economy elsewhere in the globe, but not here at home. That's the problem. Sam, you're not Let me, uh, out all for Mr. Me, Hyde. You, Sam? No, and I'm not for not helping the Soviet Union. Okay. What I'm against is an administration that seems not to recognize the crisis at home. The Commerce Department is sitting on $50 million that Congress passed and the President signed to help defense-dependent communities. We had to hold hearings to dislodge the money in the first place. They're still sitting on it. Why can't they help American workers and American communities in trouble? Mr. Gadenson? There's a crisis here. Mr. Gadenson, yes. I've got two other guests okay. here, and I'd like to ask each one of them. Dr. Sachs, tell me your reaction to the airlift. Is this a 
proper step? Well, this is a very good step. I believe that what Secretary Eagleburger said and Congressman Hyde is just right. Uh, we have very big stakes in this, and this is an important uh, step forward. I believe that it's important to keep in mind that the Russian government is undertaking a comprehensive economic change. They need more than food. They need the kind of balance of payment support to help them have a meaningful, stable currency because that's really what's going to keep this new democratic government going. So I look forward to the next round of conferences uh, that uh, Secretary, Secretary Eagleburger uh, mentioned uh, and think that it's very important that this agenda be a broad one to support the whole economic reform program. President Yeltsin has made very clear in recent days that in addition to food aid, that the Russians desperately need financial assistance for stabilization purposes of the sort that the Eastern European governments have received. And I think we have to listen carefully to what President Yeltsin has said. He's right and he understands the fragility of the situation inside Russia. Dr. Shelton, how about the airlift? Good step or not? I think it's a very generous package. I think it reflects well on the charitable spirit of taxpayers in the West who have been living under the Soviet nuclear threat all these years and who are going through tough times, certainly in the United States. Uh, I would hate to see it followed up with a massive financial aid program, and I think it's unseemly for the Russians to be demanding more at a time when I think the West has really pulled together to help them. Well, going beyond the airlift uh, and going back a day to President Bush's pledge of uh, $645 million in additional aid, are we now on the right step toward saving and stabilizing the old Soviet Union? Well, that's what I'm afraid of. I think we're stabilizing and uh, reinforcing a kind of central command of the economy. Whenever uh, G7 governments get involved, and especially through IMF or World Bank programs, and try to dictate to the Russians and the other republics how they should carry out economic reform and take a very rigid supervisory role in saying, you must now do this, you must now do that, and basically picking up where central planning left off, that I think retards not just uh, radical economic reform, but I think it offends the dignity of the Russians. They should be doing it in their own way, on their own terms, without being subject to uh, a Simon Legree in the West saying, uh, if you want the money, here's how you have to do it. Do you, do you think uh, uh, aiding our aid to the, the old Soviet Union is locking in the old Soviet system? Yeah, just on the contrary. <laughs> you have in place the most radical reformers. This is something maybe not uh, properly understood in this country yet. Uh, but Boris Yeltsin not only has taken personal responsibility for radical reforms, but in late November he elevated to power uh, the most uh, radical market-oriented reformers in the whole country. They've undertaken a stunning package of measures uh, already. Uh, they are proceeding along the lines of radical change. No one's telling them what to do. They are following a path that they know is necessary to get out of a catastrophic mess left behind by the communists. Uh, so they're following uh, desperate actions because they're in a desperate financial situation. They have a hyperinflation uh, on their hands. This is uh, something uh, of an absolute uh, catastrophe. Uh, to solve that, it's well known that you need humanitarian assistance. Uh, you also need stabilization support. And this is a uh, decades-long experience uh, in the world that to get out of this kind of financial catastrophe, getting a sound uh, money... Uh, and getting some international backing in a situation where they have no foreign exchange reserves whatsoever right now let me ask, is absolutely urgent. Let me ask Mr. Hyde, if I may. Uh, the other day, after President Bush made his pledge, uh, Majority Leader Gephardt said that uh, the president must take the lead in explaining to the American people what their self-interest is. Is that a problem uh, in, in Chicago? I mean... Uh, uh, generations of American constituents have been convinced by generations of politicians that the Soviet Union is their enemy. It's a big problem, and um, Mr. Gephardt is quite right. Although not just the president, I think those members of Congress on both sides of the aisle have got to do uh, some leading uh, to explain to the American people why it is in our interest that the Soviet Union not regress into some fascist state. They still have 27,000 nuclear weapons, an awful lot of people, and when they're hungry, the rules go out the window. The Soviet Union is a treasure trove of oil, gold, and minerals. It's one of the most resource-rich places on the earth, and they one day will be able to be a very good trading partner with everybody. 
There are all kinds of reasons why we must seize the moment and not let her go down the drain. I, don't, I think we're doing the right thing. So, uh, but, but the American people uh, are not quite uh, that far along in the curve. They see uh, a conflict between our own domestic needs, which are inexhaustible and forever, and uh, uh, $645 million for the Soviet Union. But we have billions that we give other countries, uh, and so $645 million to save uh, for democracy and the market system, the Soviet Union, seems to me a good investment. But it requires leadership from the president and from Mr. Gephardt and, yes, Mr. Gadenson. Uh, Mr. Gadenson, uh, tell me the answer. Uh, uh, given the current political situation, is our national interest here or over there? Well, I think our national interest is to make a decision. And what our government is presently doing is we're spending, next year we'll spend $30 billion roughly in Europe, on operation and maintenance of a ground force to protect West Germany and the rest of Europe from a Soviet invasion. $140 billion being spent on that. We're borrowing all that money from Germans and others to pay for it. Now we're told we should borrow more money to help feed the Soviets. I'm not against what Professor Sachs is doing. And I don't think the education is that we need to explain to people that we want this, the new Russia to succeed and we want these countries to democratize. I think what we've got to understand is that we've had an administration that turns a blind eye to hungry, unhoused people in America. Yeah. And, and, and there seems to be unlimited resources if we've got to put tanks and soldiers in Germany to stop the Soviet Union. We're going to continue to do that. We're going to borrow more money to feed them and ship the stuff over there. We had $165 million uh, in USDA to send to the Soviet Union. It never got out of the United States because the administration couldn't get its program together. What I'm upset about, and I think Americans are going to resist, is as long as this president says, we can't, uh, you know, spend any money on domestic programs because that would increase the deficit. But it's okay to continue to spend $140 billion defending Western Europe and Japan from whom we can't figure out. Plus, we've got to take on this new responsibility. We near bankrupted this country uh, to bring the Soviet Union to its knees. It's now time for the <coughs> Germans and the Japanese to pay for far more. Can I ask Sam a question? Anything. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> Sam, do you support the $10 billion guarantee for housing on the West Bank? No, I think it's too large, and I think that's why uh, the president uh, pulled it. He understood it was good politics, and it's not just good politics in the it. Middle East. I think it's too large. I think that we well, how need about to, five billion? I, I think what we need to do is not send them money, but, but help them get the lower interest rates so that they can, uh, they can execute that why, program. Why don't, you, why don't you revise and extend just for a minute? Right. And let me uh, ask Dr. Shelton. This afternoon, uh, the, the German uh, foreign minister, Genscher, said that the value of today's conference was that the United States is now locked into the process and that uh, he indicated that if the old Soviet Union is admitted to the IMF and the World Bank, that it will allow the United States to give even more money to the old Soviet Union using the IMF as, as a cover. Now, what do you think of that? Well, well a cover was not his word, but... Well, I think there is some cover, though. Uh, people can say that this big price tag to extend financial aid to the Soviet Union is only 1% of U.S. defense expenditures. But in fact, when it is channeled to the IMF and the World Bank, the United States, as a major member and contributor and supporter of those organizations, will be socked with the bill. We'll have to pick up at least $12 billion of the $60 billion allotment that IMF is currently seeking. In fact, we're behind on that payment. So um, my... My feeling is that the IMF and the World Bank may not have the proper answers for Russia. I think it's very important that Russia, as a rich country, solve some of these problems on her own terms. Yes, she needs sound money, but um, instead of looking to the West to put up money to stabilize that ruble, all Russia has to do is quit printing rubles. They have to present a reasonable budget balance. That means cutting military uh, even more, down to nothing. Uh, when people are starving, as they claim they are, it's very important to devote national resources to that. They, they have to privatize. The system that's being hailed now as free market reform, all it's done is um, put the government, which owns the stores, in a position of collecting much higher prices for the food that it sells to the citizens. The problem is the government is still in the business of providing 90% of the food in Russia. And until they privatize, it really doesn't make sense to talk about free market reform and liberalized prices. Do you, do, tell me what your reaction is to that. Well, I agree with all of that as the agenda, and that is the government's very explicit agenda. 
uh, but when you come out of 75 years of communism and you've had three weeks to get your program together and you have a hyperinflation uh, on your hands so you don't uh, have everything set in place all at once. Uh, Eastern Europe also started this way and then they get privatization uh, on a, a rapid schedule and that's exactly what the Russians are going to do. So everything that Dr. Shelton said is absolutely part of this economic program. Uh, and that's what the Russians wanted. And the Russians have also asked, it's, it's they who are asking, for some financial support to help get the stabilization. Because you need political stabilization in time for the riches which are undoubtedly present to manifest themselves. And, and it will take years uh, to get uh, parts of this economy going again. Uh, this year, uh, oil production is going to fall uh, several more million metric tons. Uh, this is a disaster. They may lose the modest uh, earnings that they're now getting on exports because there's really a catastrophic situation in the oil fields. They have to get in foreign investment, but any oil company uh, will make clear that it requires billions of dollars for secondary recovery, a new investment, and so forth, and this takes time. The question, as Congressman Hyde has said absolutely correctly, is are we going to help this new government stay afloat? This is the real issue right now. And I think that Congressman Gageson would also agree that if we really want to achieve the peace dividend, if we really want to get major cutbacks on our NATO burden, we have to have uh, a democratic, stable government in Russia. We have a remarkable government doing all the things that Dr. Shelton uh, wants them to do. That's what they're struggling to do, but under extraordinarily arduous conditions, because she was right in her book. There was a coming crash. The crash is now. It's a catastrophe financially. They're fighting to get under control, and now we have a chance to help. This conference was an important step. It's important to expand the help to tie in explicitly to the economic reforms. If we can do that, link the help to the reforms, uh, get the government to stabilize, get the economy stabilized with our help but with their actions, then we really will achieve the savings of tens of billions of dollars on the peace dividend which we all need for this country. Are, are you giving, are you allowing the Soviet Union more time to get its act uh, together than you allowed the, so, the, the uh, Poland, the Polish government? I mean, oh, I thought yes. you did, in Poland, I thought you were an overnight reformer. Uh, well, so Russia, by the way, not Soviet Union, yeah. but Russia, uh, started out on January 1st just like Poland did, freed the prices, uh, let the exchange rate be determined on a mark market basis. It's the same steps. Uh, exactly. The difference is that Poland on January 1st had a stabilization fund in place uh, that the United States government had taken the leadership on. President Bush had rounded up a billion dollars from the international community to make it possible for Poland to move directly uh, to a stable exchange rate. That's what's needed here. That's what President Yeltsin asked the G7 for last month, and he's gotten a no so far uh, on that. That's, that's a shame. Poland had a IMF balance of payments support program the day that it started. That's also not present in Russia by definition because they're not members yet. So pieces of the international assistance that were crucial for Poland's program are not yet in place in Russia. There's a desperate need to get them in place quickly. This conference handled one part of what's very important to make this government and the economic reform succeed. But there's another crucial part that would have been handled were Russia a member of the International Monetary Fund, but it's not. So that means that the G7 governments must take some special leadership on this to get that other piece in place so that Russia can do what Poland was able to accomplish. But, and we've got one minute, and uh, Secretary Eagleburger has listened to every word that's been said, and I want to give him carefully. Uh, <laughs> carefully give a chance to, to make any sort of uh, well, I'm not ex sure I know, comments. I'm not sure I know where to begin. I think I may not look like it, but I begin to feel like Goldilocks. For Sam Gadenson, the porridge is much too hot. For others, it's too cold. <laughs> I think it's just about right. A, a couple of points, I think, need to be made. The first of which is this is not just about Russia. Let's remember that. This is about all of the republics of the former Soviet Union. And they range the gamut from reasonably well developed, not well developed at all. That's the first point. Secondly, for Sam Gadenson, I would point out that the Germans have spent a lot more money than we have so far in terms of assistance to the former Soviet Union and particularly to Russia. At the same time, I would say to Foreign Minister Genscher, history didn't begin yesterday. The United States has spent the last 50 years investing in this whole process, and I don't think you can wipe out most of that last 50 years. We've spent a lot of money, we've spent a lot of blood, uh, and I think that needs to be kept in mind. And finally, I guess I would say, I don't think we're centralizing again uh, by assisting as we're trying to do in what was the Soviet Union. 
the, the Soviet Union doesn't exist. These are separate republics now. I happen to think myself that before we can make the kinds of decisions that I know Dr. Sachs would like to see us make, they do have to get into the IMF. We do have to make sure exactly what their reform programs are. Okay. May I stop you there? You certainly can. Thank you, Dr. Shelton. Thank you, gentlemen. Jim? Still to come on the news hour tonight, hard economic times in the U.S. public schools and a Clarence Page essay. All across this country, bad times are forcing states to cut financial aid to local communities. We look now at the impact of such cuts on the public schools in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Tom Bearden reports. We want wealth! We want wealth! We want wealth! On the 218th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, students, parents, and educators from all over Massachusetts came not to protest onerous taxes, but to protest not enough tax money. An ongoing budget crisis had caused Governor William Well to slash aid to local government, resulting in drastic cutbacks in some school budgets. As Horace Mann, the great champion of public education in America, stood silently by, the protesters vented their anger over the cutbacks. George Counter is superintendent of schools in Holyoke, Massachusetts. We're here today to tell our representatives that we've had it. We've had it. There's a famous saying out of Boston. It's, wait till next year. Well, we're not going to wait till next year. The state cuts hit counter schools particularly hard. Holyoke, an old industrial city, has been experiencing economic problems ever since the mid-1950s, when its principal employer, the paper mills, began shutting down. Equals 32. The city had budgeted a bare-bones $29 million for its 1991-92 school year, an amount well below the state per-pupil average. But last spring, as a result of the state cuts, that was slashed by $5 million. And to make matters worse, city officials handed the schools more than $2 million in repair and utility bills that the city normally paid. I said, where's the money for those? You were paying them for years. Why don't you transfer the money over? Oh, no. Take it out of your budget. So we got a $5 million direct hit cruise missile and 2.6 of a Scud missile to pick up all the bills and everything else. The results were devastating. 221 teachers, a third of all the city's teachers, and half of all the administrators were let go. And that was just for starters. David DuPont is principal at Lynch Middle School. The Hoyle Public Schools were hit by a nuclear blast and the middle schools were ground zero. And I mean ground zero. We took the biggest hit. How many teachers did you lose? 26 teachers out of a staff of 54. Almost half. Almost half. All of the ancillary programs were cut. There's no physical education, no computer science, no print shop, no music class, no industrial arts. The teacher who did the industrial arts class here for us last year would stay after school with kids, 30 to 40 kids at a time. Uh, and uh, they'd stay here for an hour, an hour and a half, do their projects. That's all gone. So instead of them being on the streets, they would be here. Now they're on the streets. Lynch also lost four of its five buses. Last year, 240 students were bused. This year, only 35. At Holyoke High School, students are now required to pay $100 to participate in team sports. At Sullivan Elementary, enrollment was increased from four to 700 after two other schools were closed. Some classes now have as many as 40 students. Superintendent Counter tried to stretch his remaining dollars and save some teachers by instituting a longer school day and a shorter four-day week. The state said no, you gotta have the standard 180 days. I said, this is like Saigon. This is just like Vietnam. We declared ourselves a winner and left. I'm going to declare this year that we had education in Hoyoke this year. 180 days. We went 180 days. We had it. We had education here. We stacked them and we packed them in. We controlled them. We managed them. We kept them quiet. We had education here this year. 
You called it 180 days of garbage. Is that what it is? That's what it's turned out to be. The state cutbacks affected all municipal services, although the schools were hardest hit. Hoyokers had the option to raise property taxes to make up for the loss. But to do that, they had to override a state law limiting increases to 2.5%. Holyoke held two override referendums. Firemen, police, and teachers all took to the streets to ask taxpayers for their support. We're here this morning to ask the citizens of Holyoke to vote yes on override questions one and two for um, education. In the end, recession-strapped taxpayers said yes to increases for the fire department, the police, senior citizens, and trash collection but no to the schools. Chris Koss, a local jewelry store owner, voted against the school tax increase. She says voters were trying to send a message to school administrators. We're very unhappy with the SAT scores. We're unhappy with the dropout rate. We're unhappy we are second highest in the state of Massachusetts for teenage pregnancies. And we have programs coming out of our ears for this stuff. You know, obviously the money is not being well spent. And when money's not being well spent, if it was a private corporation, they would revamp it and spend it where it would be beneficial. Lily in Santiago, a Puerto Rican American with two sons in Holyoke schools, says complaints about SAT scores and dropout rates are a smokescreen for the principal reason the school override failed, racism. The school system is more than two-thirds Puerto Rican. The taxpayers are mostly white. When the override didn't pass, I really felt that um, I felt not wanted. And I thought about all those kids in, the, in school, and I, and I really had a real hard time trying to accept what people voted for, trying to understand uh, the white community, and trying not to build up hate, um, trying to be objective. Do you think the vote would have been different if the school system was 70% Anglo? Definitely. Oh, yes. <laughs> If there's an ethnic split in the Holyoke community, there's also a generational one. Many of Holyoke's voters are older, with no kids in school. Just like many of the customers at Lucchini's, a popular breakfast and lunch spot in a predominantly Irish section of town. We spoke to some of the customers about their reasons for voting against the tax increase. The average age of Holyoke has, has increased in the last 10 to 15 years of the homeowner, the taxpayer, per se. And a lot of people, unfortunately, tragically, or, or realistically, have perceived that they do not have the money at their disposal now, extra income, to pay for something like the school system. They're wasting a lot of money, uh, and I'd like to see them be, be more intelligent with the money they have. And then we're going to give them over. I'm a retired guy. I can't afford to pay more money. Well, our schools are becoming uh, uh, predominantly Hispanic, and we're seeing these kids get out of school. They're, they're not... Uh, for the most part, they're, they're, not, they're not doing anything. They're coming out and they're just, uh, again, I, they're not educated. And the people that are paying the bill are, are not Hispanic and they're looking at it and saying, uh, why should we be paying to have some kids that can't even speak English when they get out of school? Superintendent Counter has heard the same question many times before. Elected politicians say, why should the taxpayers of this city have to pay for all these poor kids? Why? And I say, hmm, maybe because in the year 2030, they're going to be leading the city. And maybe it would be good if they were educated. Or maybe, maybe if we spend some money now, we'll save ourselves some money at the other end. Violence, jails etc 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 but clearly they're not listening no es muy famosa y donde nosotros participamos todos los años if you had to pin the school tax defeat on one issue it probably would be bilingual education in this polyglot community made up largely of the children of irish polish french and puerto rican immigrants the language issue is particularly charged i would like to see the bilingual education programs um removed from our system. Other states that had the same bilingual programs that we have have abandoned them and gone into this English immersion and their students are doing so much better. The assertion is made that bilingual education is a failure. 
and that the kids ought to be mainstreamed and put in English immersion. Absolutely, just like they did in the 30s, and then they could all hit the wall in the eighth grade and go work in the mills, only the mills now are in Southeast Asia. They're not here anymore. It is an immersion. It's submersion. So the chair will entertain a motion at this, motion at this time to fund that position. If you ask most Hoyokers whom they blame for the current mess, they point to Governor Weld and Superintendent Counter and the school board. Critics charged school administrators were unresponsive, ignored earlier demands for budget cuts, and spent too much money on programs for the poor and disruptive students. Five out of the six school board members who faced opposition in last year's elections were, in fact, defeated. Ask school officials whom they blame, and they'll tell you, You can't run schools in referendum. Why are we deciding by a referendum at the local level whether kids should have reading teachers, whether we should have athletic programs for kids, whether they, we should have reasonable class sizes? That's cuckoo. It's nuts. It's broke. It doesn't work. It needs to be fixed. We need to make a basic commitment to kids, period, in this country, but more specifically in Hoyoke and in the state. In response to all the protests, Governor Weld has promised some emergency funding to help poor communities like Holyoke get through the rest of the year. But given the state's budget crisis, it's doubtful the kind of long-term commitment Superintendent Counter would like is going to happen anytime soon. Finally tonight, essayist Clarence Page, a columnist for the Chicago Tribune, has some thoughts about conspiracy theories. Famous funny man Bill Cosby recently had this to say on the subject of Magic Johnson and the mysterious origins of AIDS. I, I have no proof, but I am allowed to just believe. And since I'm not blaming anybody in particular, but I do think that this whole thing was, was human being induced to spread and, and kill certain people. What Cosby thinks is mild compared to what New York City College professor Leonard Jeffrey thinks. Last summer, Jeffrey's blamed people who had Jewish and Italian surnames for what he called a conspiracy planned and programmed in Hollywood for the destruction of black people. For years, I grew up as a youngster just like you did, going to movies where the African peoples were completely denigrated. That was a conspiracy planned and plotted and programmed out of Hollywood with people called Greenberg and Weisberg and Trigliani and whatnot. It's not being anti-Semitic to mention who developed Hollywood. Their names are there. Welcome to the world of the paranoid, where facts are never allowed to get in the way of a good conspiracy theory. Few African Americans are as extreme or offensive as Jeffrey's. But suspicions of conspiracies by somebody, somewhere, are rampant. Well over half of the black New Yorkers surveyed by a New York Times CBS News poll last year thought the government might deliberately be funneling drugs into poor black neighborhoods. And almost a third thought AIDS might have been deliberately created in a laboratory to infect black people. And the sensational drug bust of former Washington Mayor Marion Barry caused Benjamin Hooks, among others, to wonder aloud whether there was a government conspiracy against black elected officials. I want you to give me the gun. As black Americans try to make sense out of drugs, guns, and other social plagues, some of us begin to sound like Furious Styles, the colorfully named young father in the movie Boys in the Hood. In an echo of real life, Furious Styles blames the invasion of drugs and guns on a big, unidentified conspiracy. After all, he points out, we don't own any ships, we don't own any planes. They want us to kill each other off, he says. What they couldn't do in slavery, they're making us do to ourselves. Of course, you don't have to be black to believe in conspiracy theories. Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, offers a good example. Stone throws journalistic integrity to the winds as he tries to inject new credibility into long discredited theories about the Kennedy assassination. Similar cults have grown up around the notion that the Pentagon has conspired to cover up the existence of American POWs in Southeast Asia, or the possibility that President Zachary Taylor may have been the victim of poison, 
instead of a batch of bad strawberries. But if the impulse to find outside conspirators gains strength among certain people at certain times, it has gained tremendous strength among African Americans at a time when crack, AIDS, and gang wars have become leading killers of young black people. A bizarre idea? Well, history is full of bizarre notions that turned out to be true. Those who accused the late FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, of plotting against Martin Luther King and other movement leaders turned out to be right. And the world was shocked to learn just 20 years ago that government researchers had used almost 400 black men, all syphilis victims, as human guinea pigs for almost 40 years in a notorious Tuskegee, Alabama medical experiment just to study the effects of the disease. We have learned from scandals involving the CIA, Asia's Golden Triangle, the Iran-Contra affair, and the more recent BCCI scandal, to name a few, that our government occasionally maintains cozy relationships with disreputable people, including assassins, dictators, gun runners, and drug smugglers. As an old saying goes, even paranoics have enemies. Those who don't believe are stuck because it's nearly impossible to prove that a conspiracy does not exist to those who are firmly convinced that it does. Unfortunately, conspiracy theorists can be their own worst enemy. History offers brutal examples of conspiratorial talk that ran out of control and led to scapegoating, witch hunts, and pogroms. Besides, conspiracy theories hide the much more obvious and horrible truth about drugs, AIDS, and the indictment of black officials. If it is a conspiracy, it's one in which we are accomplices. Drugs, guns, and AIDS don't need conspirators to guide them. Supply follows demand. The real answers to urban social ills will come from public education, economic development, and stronger police protection. Reduce the demand, and the supply will dry up, or at least go elsewhere. Otherwise, as Furious Styles, the angry father in Boys in the Hood might say, we will be accomplices in our own enslavement. I'm Clarence Page. Again, the major stories of this Thursday, Secretary of State Baker says the U.S. will begin flights of food and medical supplies to the former Soviet republics next month. And there were published reports the United States is considering deep cuts in its nuclear arsenal, including long-range missiles. Good night, Jim. Good night, Roger. We'll see you tomorrow night with Gergen and Shields, among other things. I'm Jim Lehrer. Thank you and good night. Funding for the McNeil Lehrer News Hour has been provided by PepsiCo. <laughs> Part of helping the world live and communicate better is keeping it well informed. That's why funding for the news hour is also provided by AT&T and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. This is PBS. Acquisition of this program was made possible by Friends of Iowa Public Television. And funding for the Iowa broadcast is provided by Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, since 1861, an environment for academic excellence. And by CRST, a family-owned company based in Iowa and a major truck carrier in the United States, which is proud to support the McNeil Lara News Hour. Do Iowa's courts discriminate against you? That is the focus of a statewide task force, and we'll listen in on one of their public hearings on living... Despite its ungainly appearance, there are few animals as magnificent as a moose. For the Athabascan Indians of Alaska, the moose... 